Welcome back, everybody. From the first time I heard Dave Warnock tell his story, I knew I wanted him to speak at court. Dave was a conservative evangelical pastor and church leader for almost 40 years. In addition to the many losses he suffered upon walking away from the faith, Dave also received the devastating diagnosis of ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, which will take him from us within the next five years. Instead of giving up, Dave decided to begin dying out loud. Learn more about Dave and his dying out loud tour in our exhibit hall. It's my pleasure to welcome a man who makes everyone feel like his friend, Dave Warnock. Welcome, Dave. Hey, Janice. Thank you. That's very sweet. Make everyone feel like his friend. I like that. That's a high compliment. Well, you know, I, um, I, the Dying Out Loud tour, as we all know, kind of got interrupted by a little virus. Um, as Daryl Ray talks about viruses, this virus shut the world down, basically. It's not like the God virus, but it's just as bad. <laughs> I uh, thank you, Janice, for um, allowing me to speak. I'm, I'm excited about this conference. I've been looking forward to it. And then when, obviously, when COVID shut down the, the real thing, then we had to shift to the online uh version and Janice just did an incredible job in my opinion of uh, her tenacity with this it has just been remarkable that she just wouldn't wouldn't back up just through all the problems that that had to be overcome she just kept pushing through so hats off to you Janice um, well done um, and I've been I've been enjoying all the speakers and all the different ideas it looks like today is death day uh, <laughs> the theme of today is death uh, which is appropriate. I mean, that's that's what I talk about. And I'm going to talk today um, about the fear of death and and the trauma that that causes um, and where that comes from, essentially, because it's not a natural idea. It's it's a thing that's imposed upon us. And I'll explain that a little bit more. But the, for those of you that don't know the Dying Out Loud story, um, I'm going to give a little bit of a backdrop. Um, just to give context to, to the to the subject matter and, and why I talk about death like I do and dying like I do. But um, as Janice mentioned in the intro, I was an evangelical um, Christian and minister for uh, almost 40 years, 37 or so. Um, I wasn't all, all the way, all the time in ministry. I wasn't like, I didn't go to, I've not done anything in my life the typical way. I, I, it's just been a, a fucking messy life. Oops, I, is this PG-13 or R? I, I can't go very long without dropping F-bombs. And um, anyway, I didn't go to seminary. I never was fully trained to be a minister, but it was the call of God kind of thing. So early on in my Christian life, I was swept up in the Jesus movement in, <clears throat> in the early 70s, in 1973. December 26th, about nine o'clock, is when I became a born-again, spiritual Christian, because that was the first time I spoke in tongues. And I loved Alice Gretchen's um, a session on the neurology and the neurological uh, components behind that. My, I, I wasn't one of those Pentecostals who was caught up in the, it wasn't like the Holy Spirit would, would take over and I would utter glossolalia. It was, it was more of a disciplined, learned behavior for me. And when they prayed for me in, in 1973 to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, because if I wanted to be a full, full gospel Christian, if I wanted to really be all in and, and have the power and the, all of the things that God had made available to us, then I needed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So that, that was my experience. And that was what I thought real, true Christians should be doing and should be about. And it, it needed to be the full experience. And so I, I bought into to that fully. And my speaking in tongues for instance i could i could for a dollar a minute i'll speak in tongues as long as you guys want i'm like a trained monkey and i can still speak in tongues to this day so that in of itself is evidence that there's no holy spirit component behind it it's just my brain trained to to repeat these syllables in a, such a way that i had convinced myself with some kind of a spiritual language and, and so I actually did speak in tongues on a podcast once just because they double dog dare me. And who can, re, who can refuse a double dog dare, right? And it was just the, the hosts were 
I think it was Cognitive Dissonance. If you've seen that podcast, I've heard that podcast, you can go look it up. But they were just rolling. They fell out of their chairs rolling in laughter. It was a, it was a moment. But I digress. Um, and then so that began my journey through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Um, I married, uh, raised three kids in the faith. And, and early on in my Christian walk, I love that phrase, don't y'all? Um, I, I was recognized uh, by spiritual leaders as someone who had the anointing. There's another buzzword. The call of God was all over me. And I, I, looking back, it, it's nothing more than the, than the fact that I had a, a personality that was gregarious. I had uh, the ability to communicate and put sentences together. And so that, in their view, was the call of God. And so they're all saying, you, you know, you're called to be a minister. And so I said, OK, that sounds pretty good. And um, so I started doing that. And I was ordained and licensed and, and uh, just went the call of God route instead of the seminary route. I've never been trained in anything in my life. I've always just winged it. Um, but I felt like that was enough. I felt like the call of God was all you need. And so I did that. And my whole life, I was, it was a combination of sometimes I'd be on staff at a church. Other times I would be um, entrepreneurial and have my own business or working in some way. So it was a hodgepodge career. And uh, I didn't ever at any point, I followed my older brother into the faith. He influenced me because he got swept up in the Jesus movement at college. And so I began to be influenced by him. And I, 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 I recall that looking back on it, because we all, we've all had these moments where we go, what, what happened? How did that happen? How did I believe that for so long? What was I thinking? What was wrong with me? We've all had that kind of identity crisis, post-conversion, deconstruction. And so as I look back, I realized I was in a very vulnerable place in my life. I was after high school without really clear direction, had a sense that I wanted to be a sports writer, but didn't really have a lot of direction and how to get there. My parents weren't very instructive or very involved. And I was kind of on my own. And I really didn't know. I didn't have a lot of self-confidence. And I, I, and I felt a little bit lost. And here comes Jesus with all the answers. Just here's the book. Read the book. Do the thing. All your problems are taken care of. Oh, and by the way, at the end of it, you go to heaven. I mean, you just sign right here. And so I did. And I never, ever, for 35 years or more, sat down to really examine my faith, why I believed, what I believed, what the origins of it were, was the Bible what I thought it was, because, you know, they, I was told it was the Word of God. I was a believer that it was inerrant, like every word was true, everything was, was inspired by God. If it's in the Bible, the Bible says that I believe it, that settles it. Boom. And, um, and I just believed it full on, and I studied and taught the Bible for three and a half decades, unquestioning anything in it. And any anytime I would have a hint of a thought that there was an inconsistency or a, or a contradiction, I would just brush it aside as though, you know, it, it wasn't that important that the bigger message got through and all those kind of things. But I never gave it the weight of instruction that it that it deserved. And so there I, I woke I woke up um, as things began to as questions began to pile up and answers weren't forthcoming and i really I, i've said it this way several times and i think it's a good distillation for me that i really just got tired of making excuses for god's poor behavior and and there were time and time again when god should show up the god i believed in was a god that was present that was involved that answered prayers that that gave you instruction he wasn't a behind the scenes kind of guy. He was, it was a God that I was supposed to be involved with on a daily basis. You, you get up, you had your quiet time, you pray, you, you do your journaling, you blah, 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 blah. And, and when, time after time when God should have been showing up, he just never did. And at, at, at a point in my early 60s, now I'm in, I'm in my early 50s, it's been a, a decade, a little over a decade since I deconstructed. And I'm 65 now. So, yeah, I was in my 50s, mid 50s. Um, I finally just said, what the hell? Is he really here? So I really started. I started a thorough examination. I remember writing out on yellow legal pads, side by side, different um, 
passages in the Gospels, for instance, that were supposed to be describing the same event, like the birth of Christ and the resurrection and so on. And I, I saw the inconsistency and I go, wait a minute, it's a pretty important event here. I would think they would need to get the details right. And when I realized that the details were all over the board and it was a mess, and I thought, if, if, they, if the Bible is not clear on an event like the resurrection, which as Paul said, is the most important event, if, if Christ be not raised, then our faith is in vain. And if that's not accurate, if I can't count on that, then what am I supposed to do with the rest of it? And so for me, the, the deconstruction element was um, a major, the, 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 the Bible not being uh, true, not being inspired, not being inerrant. When that domino fell, when I came to the um, really sad conclusion. I was not wanting this to be the answer I found. I was wanting my examination to reinforce my faith that was faltering. But when the Bible, when I realized the Bible was just a man-made document, um, the rest of the dominoes for me fell really, really quickly. And I came to the easy conclusion that this is not easy, but swift conclusion that this is not real. This is, this is, uh, this is bullshit. This is made up. I was wrong. Uh, and to admit you're wrong after all those years is not an easy thing. And those of you in this meeting and others I've talked to, I want to say, I say this often, it takes courage to admit you're wrong when you're that heavily invested. And, and those of us that have done that have done a courageous thing. So if you haven't recognized that about yourself, then you need to do that. You need to recognize that I, I had exhibited a lot of courage to admit something that I believed in deeply believed in for all those years to, to simply look up one day and say, I was wrong about that. So after, after my deconstruction, as Janice alluded to, I was um, struck with the uh, diagnosis of ALS. This was a long, a long span though. It wasn't like the next day or all those things. So after about 10 years of living as an, as an atheist and letting go of my faith, I ended my marriage because my wife stayed. Um, in the faith. And I, I've had really problems with uh, cohabitating with someone who believed in things that really I saw as problematic and, and trauma inducing, as we're talking about in this conference. It's not a benign thing, evangelical Christianity. It does harm. And I began to see that after I got out of it. And I began to look back on the harm that I had in, inflicted on others, um, not, not intentionally. Um, as Maya Angelou said in the quote I live by now, do the best you can do until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. And so that's what I, that's how I explain my exit from evangelicalism into atheism. And, and so I lived uh, several years that way. And then in uh, February of, of 2019, um, I got the diagnosis of ALS. And so I went from just being a, a boring insurance salesman, um, after, after my faith, I was living a good life as, as a single adult and, and making a good living in the insurance business. And then all of a sudden, I get this diagnosis that tells me I'm going to, um, according to the statistics, live three to five years. And that was now three years ago. I've had symptoms for three full years or more. Um, and I immediately quit working. I started selling stuff, giving stuff away. I thought, Whatever time I have left, I'm going to live it full on. I'm going to carpe the fucking diem. That's a phrase we began to use. Um, and so I really, uh, the Dying Out Loud um, tour or, or organization that we formed kind of happened organically. Marie LePage, some of you know Marie, um, had started putting me in touch and getting me booked on podcasts and YouTube shows <laughs> and um, scheduling in-person events back when those things were a thing. And I started traveling to speak and uh, which, you know, it, it came naturally. I, the first uh, talk I gave was at the Unitarian Church in Minneapolis in July of 2019. And uh, I, it was like, I, I, it was the first time I'd been in a pulpit uh, in, in, 10 or more years and it was just like riding a bicycle you just I just felt it felt so I felt so at home and I thought golly I could do this um so I did I started doing it and traveling all over the country and 
and we had plans to travel to Europe and, and so on. And, but all that got shut down with COVID. But uh, you know, you know that story, that's a tired story. Um, so the dying out loud thing in, in that, uh, in those things I started talking about, it, it's, it's a, like I said, it happened organically and it's, it's a, um, uh, it's a phrase that we just came upon. I don't even know who thought of it, but, it sounds, cat sounds catchy, so we, we took went with it. It's really, more, what I talk about more is, is living out loud and living your best life. And because, you know, I came to the conclusion when I left Christianity that this life is the one life we have. In fact, there's a new t-shirt design coming out. We've got t-shirts and swag, see the dang out loud. Um, uh, you gotta get one if you don't have one. We have a lot of designs, but the new one we have, one of the new ones we have is a quote, is from a poem that I started talking about called my soul has a hat and the last line says we we have two lives and the second one begins when you realize you only have one and and so that's a new design on the t-shirt so order yours now um anyway i i really started talking a lot about um facing death looking at life and death uh, from an atheist perspective in contrast to the one i had before as a conservative evangelical christian and looking at what we do with our lives. And, and, and another phrase we, we coined is it's all about the moments. And I really began to realize that it really is about the moments, the isolated individual moments that we encounter throughout our days and weeks and months and years. And what we do with those moments is everything. It's, it's what life is. It's where we get the value and the purpose. People say, how does an atheist have purpose? How does an atheist find meaning? You find meaning and purpose in the moments. What are you doing with the moments that that you come across, that you pre, that you present yourself with, the opportunities that you have to have moments, and and they're everywhere. And that's what I started talking about. And then I started getting all these reactions from people, messages, emails, how I mean, people in serious physical issues, mental issues, PTSD, depression, uh, cancer, th people facing people dealing with stuff that was making life hard um, started reaching out to me and telling me how much the dying out loud message meant to them. And, and, and a constant theme, and this is where I'm kind of going with this today, but a constant theme that I would hear is that it was helping a lot of people deal with their fear of death and, and the inherent uh, 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 thing that goes with that, which is a fear of hell. Uh, if you're from an evangelical conservative background, you've had this concept of hell embedded in you from childhood, many of us. Um, and so people were having a hard time divesting themselves of that ideology, even if their head knew that it wasn't real. In your mind, you know, hell's not a place. It's not a thing. I don't have to worry about it. It doesn't stop you from waking up in the middle of the night in cold sweats from a nightmare that you're burning in hell. Um, and so as, we, as others have talked about, Marlene, Dr. Marlene Linnell just spoke beautifully about these ideas and, and the, the, the trauma that's associated with that. But the fear of death in and of itself, if you're, and I'm speaking specifically to those of us who've come from conservative evangelical backgrounds, because that was the water I swam in. I don't have the knowledge of the other religions. Um, I, I didn't know them. I mean, I had a, a brief idea about most of them in the ministry working but you know like i've told people i'm um, speaking at the conference of religious trauma they have some amazing qualified speakers and then they have me uh, who's not qualified to speak about anything uh apparently except dying because i am dying out loud and so i i i started thinking through the concept of the fear of, of death and from an evangelical background where that idea has taken root. And if we look at scripture, now turn in your Bibles with me as we begin this portion of, <laughs> everybody's throwing up in their mouth now. Um, if you look in, the, in scripture, which talks about sin and death, and, and this is about the, the idea of sin, which is another, like hell, another religious construct. Sin is not a thing. Sin has nothing to do with morality or good and bad. Sin is a religious notion that has inherent alongside it the idea of you are a sinner, not, and that has to do more, not, not with what you did, but what you are. And those are huge, huge differences. So the, the, the concept of sin, that we're born as sinners, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We sing that as though that's a beautiful 
thing to sing. That's horrible. That that song should never be sung again because it 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 drives home this idea that you're a filthy wretch, you're a filthy sinner, you're dirty, you're rotten, you're broken, and you are in need of a savior. And and that idea embeds itself in us from early on, as early as we were taught that in Sunday school and by our parents. And we we begin to go through life feeling like I am, I am, I'm a sinner. I'm a broken, dirty, wretched sinner. And without Jesus, I'm just a worthless uh, smudge of dirt in the earth. And that does a number on your self-esteem. And it causes you to not think very well of yourself. And then when you when you look at what the scripture says about sin, the wages of sin is death. Anyone ever heard that one? And that sin entered the world through Adam and Eve's transgression. And through one man's sin, death entered the world. And because we are descendants of Adam, this is the, the Christian narrative, the evangelical narrative that we all, if you were in that world, that you had to buy into. But because sin entered the world through Adam, and we are descendants of Adam, then we are inheriting his inheriting his sin. And along with that inheritance of sin comes the punishment, which is death. In other words, we're told that by virtue of being born, you deserve to die as punishment, as though you've done something wrong simply by being born, which as far as I know, none of us had any choice in the matter. We were born where we were born, to whom we were born, and none of us got to say, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna sit this one out because I've heard that life's kind of hard, and at the end of it, you go to hell. So I'm just going to sit this one out. No, I'll pass. We didn't get that choice. And so the, the biblical narrative that Paul, by the way, Paul's the inventor of Christianity, not Jesus. The biblical narrative said that because you were born, you're dirty and sinful, and your punishment for that is death. Well, if that's the narrative we've been fed, excuse me, I need water. If that's the narrative we've been fed, then of course we're going to think of death as a horribly negative event. A horribly, uh, it's a punishment that that we deserve simply because we're sinners, and we're sinners because we were born. That's not healthy, folks, and that that idea that permeates us throughout our life, inflicts us with untold trauma when we begin to push against that. Now, as long as you stay in that bubble and continue to go down that stream, it's like in a river. If you're paddling downstream, there's no resistance. It's easy. But if you begin to turn and say, I'm going to go back up the stream because I don't like the direction this one's going. And when you start doing that, which is what we've done in deconstruction, then you're going to encounter the resistance. It's going to be difficult. And that's the trauma that we deal with. I remember several years into my deconstruction and, and being and my, my story also includes um, shining from daughters and uh, uh, being broken relationships, which I can speak more to if we want to in the Q&A. I just had some recent developments in that that are positive. But, but my daughters pretty much shut me out once I deconstructed and I told them I was no longer a Christian. And that con con conjunction with my, in conjunction with my deconstruction, when I was seeing a therapist, he, after several sessions, he told me, you are suffering from, from PTSD, pure and simple. This is a, as clear a case of PTSD as I've ever seen. And it was the kind, and I'm not, I, I'm terrible at, at these things because I don't make notes, but it's the kind that there's two kinds in the, and one is worse than the other. And Janice and others will know what I'm talking about. But, uh, there's, there's the kind that's, that comes upon you through a single event, and there's the kind that comes through repeated events of the same nature. And mine was that, and that was worse. <laughs> and I was a mess. For a lot of years, I was a mess and very depressed and just and, and, and thinking, how am I going to go through the rest of my life like this? And so when I decided to exit the marriage and kind of reboot my life, uh, that was in 2016, and that was when I considered, uh, like, I just kind of started over. At, at, at a very late age in life. And then coming into, the, into after that was the diagnosis with ALS two years later. So it kind of threw a real uh, monkey wrench into what I, would, what I would call the best years that I was living. I was living, living my best life. But the dying out loud work that I began to do as I, as I was talking about, it, ga it gave me a, a little bit of insight that I never had as a Christian, obviously. 
on the nature of death and dying and how people look at that. And what I've begun, and, and so I began to I began to really help folks break that down. When when they talk about with me at, at Q and A at, at public meetings and even at, at things like this and in private conversations, and I've gotten a lot of private emails and things from people who say I still struggle with the idea of dying and, and what that looks like, what's on the other side. And as we begin to break it down, which is what I think is a healthy thing to do, I, I ask them, what are, what is it exactly? What part of that process of dying are you afraid of? I don't know. I, I, um, I, I don't know. And, and so what I say, when you think about what actually happens, you go to sleep, you, be, you, you become unconscious, and you don't wake up. That's it. You're not aware the next day that you didn't wake up. You're not aware that you're dead. You're not aware that you didn't, you're not alive. You're not aware of anything. This is my understanding of it. And as others have said, we don't know. We don't know what's on the other side of the curtain because nobody has come back from there, uh, Bible stories notwithstanding. Um, and so my best guess is though, based on evidence and common sense, that when I go to sleep, I won't be aware of the fact that I'm not alive. So what part of that is there to be afraid of? What exactly is, is fearful? And when you look at it that way, you really think not really much. And, and I, I tell people more when they say, are you afraid of dying? Because I'm now facing it as a terminal ill, uh, as a person with a terminal illness. I say, I'm not really afraid of the process of dying. What I'm more afraid of, or what I'm reluctant to let go of, is life and the moments and, and the living. And so what I'm doing, when I say dying out loud, I'm really living out loud. I'm getting, I'm grabbing the most out of life that I can. I'm, I'm jumping out of airplanes with a parachute on and a person on my back, um, which was uncomfortable, but they, they kind of required it. Um, I'm going to go scuba diving. We're tra Babin and I are traveling as much as we can. We're going to do road trip next week. A uh, big one ne this summer. Um, traveling to Europe in the fall, if, if COVID will allow us, if my health will allow us, because I'm losing strength. I'm getting weaker. Things are getting harder. Um, but as long as I can do anything, I'm going to grab the moments in life. And so that's the part when, when I think about dying and when, when I think about the end coming it's not the death that I'm afraid of. It's not the death that I'm uh, pushing back from or running from. It's the, la the lack of the ability to have moments and connections with people. Our road trips, for instance, are, are as much about connecting with people. Some people I know already and others who have connected with online through the Dying Out Loud and other ways and, and want to meet in person and, and have moments with. There's a, a person out in Seattle that has ALS and he's already in a wheelchair. He's young. And his wife reached out after hearing me on a show and, and just said, you know, we would love to meet you if it ever was possible. So, you know what? I thought, I can do that. What else am I doing? Um, and so we're going to do stuff like that. And, and, and so the death part, the, the sin and the death part is, the, is the, what I would consider and what I, what I really wanted to bring home today, that once you let go of the idea that sin is a thing, then you can let go of the idea that death is a punishment for that. And then you can let go of the idea that death is a negative thing. Death is nothing more than the natural result of living. And we're all going to do that. No one gets out of this alive. Uh, the problem we have with it is we don't know how or when. And so what I've talked about for the last two years and what I want, will continue to talk about as long as I can is what are you doing with the life you have? You have this one shot. And if you don't like the narrative that you, your story is telling, if you don't like the story you are writing, then it's, it's on you. No one's going to write that for you. When I rebooted my life in 2016, I saw I, my ALS causes me to itch a lot. I'm not, I'm not picking my nose. It's, it's scratching. Um, uh, when you, when I rebooted my life, I, my, thought process was I'm going to take back the pen from those who have been writing my story. And I realized the ones who were writing my story were not people. They were grief, depression, sadness over things I've lost, family, primarily, uh, my faith, 
not not knowing how to, how to move forward after that. I learned that after a few years, but the initial reaction was sadness and uh, disorientation and loneliness. I didn't have a community that I've I've discovered since then, and so the 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 things that were writing my story was was all these other emotions, and it wasn't me. And I said, I'm going to write my I I I use phrases that help me. I'll finish my own fucking story, thank you. And I took the pen back from all those other things, emotions, experiences, people. And I said, I'm going to write the story I want to write. And it's, it's going to be what I want it to be. And, and that's what I say to people. If you're not happy with, with the story that's being written, then you got to change it. No one else is going to. And if you don't like the life you're living, then as much as you can, change it. And that's what I've been doing. And, and so I think that's what's been resonating with people that hear the Dying Out Loud story and, and the message that I'm trying to, to. And that doesn't mean that I do this perfectly. Oh, my God, I'm still the flawed human I always was. I just, I'm not a sinner. So I've learned that. I'm just a human. And a human makes mistakes. A human does good and does bad. And when I, when I learn uh, that sin is not a thing and I let go of that idea, and the death and punishment that comes with that, then it's just a simple matter of living. And, and what, what is, okay, if I made a mistake, then I go to the person that I hurt or the mistake that I made. And I say, you know what? I should have done that differently. I, I, I can do better than that. So I'm really sorry that that hurt you. But it doesn't reflect on who I am. That's the difference. Let me say that again. It's not about the wrong thing you did. Those are things we all do. What the concept of sin and sinner creates within us and the message it gives us is you are a sinner. You are a bad person. It's not that you did a bad thing. It's you are a bad person. And we have to throw that away. We have to throw that where it belongs in the garbage because that, that is a bad message. It's a wrong message. It's incorrect. It's not true. It's what religion puts on us to control us. Pure and simple. If I can convince you that you're a sinner in need of a savior, if I can give you, if I can convince you that you have a disease that only I have the medicine for, then you're going to have to come to me over and over and over for it. And if you depart from that, you're on your own and you're going to suffer destruction. That's what we've been told. So the, the, the religion has created the disease and then sold us the only remedy. Well, of course, they're going to control us. Of course, they can manipulate us. But the truth is, that's a lie. And once we realize that, freedom, <laughs> it's, 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 it's life-changing. And so those of us who still experience trauma from those incorrect messages, that's what this is for. That's what court is for. That's what secular therapy is for. That's what good, good healthy relationships are for working through that trauma and don't quit don't quit working on that until you can can say to anyone and to yourself that's not bothering me anymore and here's a case uh, i told you we and i'm gonna give it a, a couple minutes and then give a few minutes for q a because i always do this i always talk to them uh I, I i had this separation from my daughters they, they pretty much shut me out after my uh departure from christianity and that's been a that's been the story for almost a decade now, and I've tried I tried for a long time to to change that story to to breach that gap, and I just couldn't make any headway. And so I finally had to just let it go, let it go. I I just had to quit being emotionally invested in that, and it, it's easy to say, very hard to do. Um, and it took uh, for a lot of years. That's what I was saying. That grief and sadness was was writing my story. And when I really just said, no, 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 I'm going to write my own. And so just this past year, just this past few months, uh, one of my daughters has, has, for some reason, and I don't know why, because uh, I would continue to reach out every now and then. Can I, can I, you know, I've got six grandkids. Um, one I've never met and one I just met last week. Um, so a lot of estrangement there. And I, uh, I, I sent them both an email. I reach out every now and then. I sent them both an email before Christmas. Can I get the grandkids? So they're for Christmas. And I heard back from one and she said, yes, that'd be great. And so I began this uh, dialogue with her on Marco Polo, 
uh, for you kids, that's a that's an app you can do videos on. Um, and and so we began to talk back and forth. And she had the grandkids on, and they would say, "Hey, pops, I haven't seen you." Blah blah blah. They call me pops. Just last week, we met up first time in five years. I've seen either of my daughters or any of my grandkids. <laughs> Sorry. It was a moment. Yeah. It was a moment. And like I said, the moments are everything. It's all about the moments. And but what I what I realized, because Bevan said, Are you nervous? And I and I looked and I said, I'm really not. Because I don't have anything invested emotionally. I'm not, I'm not counting on anything. I don't have any expectation. And my work that I've done in the last 10 years freed me from that. So I can go to this thing, have the moment, walk away from it, love the moment, live the moment and then not have any expectation on the backside of it, not have to connect it to a story or a bigger narrative. It's just what it was. And if we get another one a few months from now or whatever, that'd be great, but I'm not counting on it. I'm not invested in it. I hope that makes sense. And I had to find a way to remove myself from the trauma and, and the emotion of it and just live in the moment and get the, take, take what I can from the moments and not have any expectation around it. And that's when I realized, this was another example of where I realized I'm really free from this shit. It really has no claws in me anymore. And, and I, I, don't, I don't get triggered by anything. So I'm here to say, if you're fresh in your deconstruction, if the trauma is still uh, troubling you in great ways, there is freedom coming, just stay with it. Because you can get to the place where this, the hooks that that religion had in you and those people had in you have been removed and the wounds have healed over. They're going to be scars, but they're not wounds and they don't hurt. And that's the freedom that we're all looking for. And that's what's there. So I, I hope that is helpful to you guys. Now, uh, Janice, so we got about 10, 12 minutes. So let's do some Q&A and anything's on the table. There are no questions off limits. If you want to talk about dying and death, Death with Dignity, I talk about that a lot, which I haven't had time to, to touch on today, but I'm happy to, to answer any questions as long as we have time. Um, I would like to know about uh, that death with dignity. So yeah. in Canada, we have medical assistance in dying um, all across the country that's available to people. Um, I don't know if you have anything similar in parts of the United States. Yeah, there's about a half a dozen, no, about eight states in the D.C. that that have a, uh, a death with dignity law. That's but it's a it's a very limited law. There's a lot of limitations and conditions for someone like me. Uh, for instance, th they require you to be within six months of death, as attested by two physicians. For someone like me with ALS, which is a very very debilitating disease, those last six months are really really bad. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for me, life is not about the quantity of the moments or the days. It's about the quality of them. And, and that sounds like a T-shirt, but it's, it's true. I want quality life, not quantity. Mm -hmm. And so I probably wouldn't use one of those services or one of the, I wouldn't, to go to one of those states and do that. There's an organization that uh, I connected with last year called the Final Exit Network. There's a link to it on my website. They... Uh, they help people with terminal diseases and other situations um, uh, arrange for death on my terms, in my timing, on my terms. They, they help you with equipment you need. And there's more details than we have time to go into, but, you know, legal issues and all the things that we need to put in place. So mm -hmm. it does what it does is puts gives someone like me the control and the choices that we look for. Yes, and, and I'm happy to say they are one of our exhibitors at court. People I saw that to our exhibit hall and see. Fun they're an incredible organization, and they're all, it's a, it's a nonprofit, they're volunteers, and they, they just do incredible work. So I'm glad that they connected here. Yeah, me too. Okay, uh, here we have a question. What are the main differences between what your daily life and habits looked like before your diagnosis versus after? your daily life and habits? Well, I, I, I was working before, um, and, you know, that, that consumed a large portion of my time was, was making a living. Um, I, I, I'm more, I live more in the immediacy of the moment now than I did then. I think that's the primary difference because I realized, you know, life is, is truly short and, and I, it, it really got shortened for me. So I'm more cognizant of time and 
COVID was a real kick in the gut for me because it really took a, I basically, in my mind, took a year away from me that I just didn't have to give. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it really took me a long time to get my head back in the game. It, it was a, it was a real hard adjustment to make. And so I, I'm, I'm just trying to do more of, I'm, I feel like, I feel like I've got five plates spinning. I, I retired it. I got a terminal diagnosis and retired and I'm busier than I've ever been. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's a good busy because otherwise I would just be sitting around waiting to die, watching Bonanza. And that's no, that's no good. So I love the involvement I have in the atheist community of the secular world, the speaking I do, the connections I have. Um, I'm starting, I'm going to start a YouTube uh, call in show next month. Um, and I'm writing a book. I'm writing my memoir. I'm wow. working really hard on that. So I'm just, <laughs> balls to the ball I, I just told Bevin when they get to relax and said you're the one doing all this <laughs> <laughs> you are yeah you're just an inspiration you're going 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 and I love how encouraging you are uh, to other people that this is the life that you have if yep. you're not happy with what's going on make a change yep. this is the time that you have you can do it. And, and I know that there are situations in there. Everybody's life is different. Everybody's situations are different. And it's not as easy, I know, to do that um, for everyone. But mm -hmm. I, I, you can do it. At some level, you can do it. Mm -hmm. and, and there's help out there available. Um, Secular Therapy Project, Recovering from Religion. I mean, just resource after resource. Dr. Winnell's mm -hmm. workshops. I mean, your workshops. I mean, they're... If, if you're looking for help and serious about making changes that matter, the, the people and resources are there. Exactly. We have another question. Do you feel um, death with dignity, which is often inhibited by people not wanting to play God, do you feel death with dignity is partly what fuels your atheist activism? Not entirely. It's, it's a component of it. It's a small portion of what I talk about and what I uh, represent. Um, I think it's important in, in terms of giving people options. And, and the old playing God thing is, is the ridiculous notion. I've, I've sparred with a few Christians on that in different shows. And my response to them is, then you don't go to the doctor? Is that what you're saying? So mm -hmm. because if you go to the doctor and take medicine or have surgery, then you're, in essence, playing, playing God because you, otherwise you would just allow God to do whatever he wants with your body. So that idea that you can't play God is just ridiculous. And the, the whole way that we allow people to die, we're, we're much more compassionate to our pets than we are to our people. That's just the, the honest truth. And the way that we uh, force people to die in this country, um, it, I, I think it's because we have this religious under, undercurrent is, is like this underground river that's running through America and many parts of the world, not just America, but but any, anywhere where that idea is is put upon us that you can't do that, you know, you have to let God take you out when he's ready. Mm -hmm. um, that that has that's a religious idea, and and I reject it wholesale. Mm -hmm. Right on. Yeah, it's because it's very it's very disempowering for sure. Okay. And your message is so um, liberating. The the fact that there is no such thing as sin, and that and that death is natural. It's just yes. a natural part of, of living. But we've been sold the idea that it's some kind of punishment. Mm -hmm. And, and any, anything that is viewed as a punishment is going to carry with it a lot of baggage mm -hmm. and a lot of trauma and a lot of fear. And if we divest ourselves of that and just say, no, 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 it's just I, I'm going to die because I've lived. And you know what? The alternative would, would be not to have ever lived. And, and I'm, I'm thankful that I've lived. Life is a wonderful thing. And, and I talk about dying and having choices at the end, but I'm not in any hurry. I, I love life, mm -hmm. even with my limitations. And it's getting more challenging all the time and, and tiring. But I still look at the alternative and I think, you know what? We're, I, I just love life. I love people. I love connecting with them. And so, uh, but at the end of that, I'm going to expire. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. It's okay. You know, I think people might have been concerned tuning into this session that um, it was just going to be really heavy. But anyone who has uh, has watched and has listened to what you've said to us today, it's your lightness of being that really 
comes through. You, you are such a joy. I just love spending time with you. Thank you for being a, a speaker at the Conference on Religious Trauma. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay, everyone. Thanks for your questions. And oh, just a deep breath after that. <laughs> so good. Thank you, Dave. Bye. Bye.